3, and 5 are numeric values, are number values. And even though Python is uh, dynamically typed and you don't have to do a lot of type declaration, Python is typed. And so you have types underneath. You can get um, uh, problems with using the wrong type in the wrong scenario. Um, but the point is, is that these values here, you can basically ask Python, what type is a value, if you're kind of curious. Uh, we go over here real quick. And you can see that Python will tell you the type. Now, int in this case is short for integer, but uh, this type is uh, just based off of the value that I passed in. If I decide to say, what is the value of 3.5, then it'll say there's a float type. Now these names, int, float, they come from a history of C programming where characters were very uh, expensive. I mean, in the old days, you really had to punch punch cards. And you really did not want to have too many letters in anything because it just meant that it was even longer to write your programs. And so the, uh, the int is typically short for integer. Float is typically short for uh, floating point values. And the floating point values are the uh, IEEE uh, floating point values in Python. <coughs> And so down here, you'll notice that I'm pretty cavalier when I start throwing these things around here because these things, I'm just using these quotes here in order to emphasize items. It is a name type token, all right, and its value is print. Now this part right here, it'll probably turn that into its own token. Okay, it is a parenthesis token. This right here, it's not particularly useful to most languages to deal with pieces of the string. <coughs> it's going to have to pass this whole string in when it's time to evaluate this function. So it'll probably see this opening quote and start searching down for the end closing quote and render this whole thing out as a string value token, which of course the value will be high. And then it will see this end token, okay? And so what we'll have is we'll have this small bit of something inside the computer, okay? And it'll say something like name print, Open parent. Okay. The string high, and then the close parent. And this will all be attached to whatever sort of chunk of this program this thing is. When these tokens don't come in the right order or don't come in the right pattern, you'll get a violation of the grammar of that language. And it'll say something along the lines of, I have absolutely no idea what you just did. <laughs> <laughs> Fixing that to where it not only understands what you typed, but does what you wanted. That entire process is a combination of writing programs and debugging. Okay. Maybe it was a little bit deeper <coughs> dive than was needed, but do you understand the idea now? Awesome. Okay, so I'd like to go now and I, uh, well shoot, I just gave away the answer to number one. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so what do you think would happen in a print statement if you left out one of the parentheses? Syntax error. Thank you. Okay, and the reason why is because these tokens no longer conform to the grammar that the language accepts. Okay. And uh, if you're trying to print a string, what happens if you leave out one of the quotation marks? Oh. Same 
let's say, let's say we leave out the ending quotation mark. Well, but the point is, is that it'll find the end of the program before it finds the closing quote mark. So you're probably going to come up with, you know, an error of some sort that, hey, I got to the end of the program, I realized that you probably had something more to say than just a string that you never finished it. And you'll get an error. Okay? And if you see a minus sign to make a negative number, what happens, do you think, if you put a plus sign in front of it? Let me give a, a physical example on this one because this one is kind of vague. And so for all those people who are a little bit more visual, what do you think would happen if you did that? Get four? Two. It's two. It's two? Okay, well, it is two. Yeah, but when you think about how languages work, why is it two? Because it can handle negative integers. Because it can handle negative integers. So this means that this minus sign, it doesn't get converted into an operator. It gets included in the token that's holding this value. Does that have to do with precedence as well? It does have to do with uh, precedence, but precedence is uh, reserved in computer science for which side, uh, no, which operations occur first and last. These quotes around here indicate that this is a string of things that might be typed in. It's not actually interpreted as a number. It's interpreted the same way as if, like, you know, Ed was interpreted. Okay, and so if we take a look at the uh, type of a string value, you'll see <coughs> that it'll say that it's a class string. Okay, now Python's typing system is a traditional object oriented typing system. So this means that all of the types are tied to this concept of class, all right? And a class is a category or organization of types. Eventually, we will go into more of the details on what that means, but for right now, all you need to understand is that basically, when you use this type operator, it's going to tell you what the type is, okay? It'll give you the string that is associated with that type. Who here has ever used a typed language before? Okay. All right. Am I boring anybody yet? No, I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but the, the basic stuff is, is kind of dry and hard to get. When you get into some of the more uh, complicated ideas, then it gets a little bit more uh, interesting. One of the um, points that the author wants to make in programming, for those who are very new to programming, is that there's these things called formal languages and informal languages. Now, um, way back when, when if you ever had to take like a typing class, you probably had to learn the format of a formal business letter. Okay, and it's very different than the formal than the format of a letter that you would write for somebody else. The structure of a formal language is even more formal than a format of a formal business letter. Literally, the uh, choice of like whether or not you put a value or an operation or whatever, all of these things are decided by rules. And these rules all together are called the grammar of the language, okay? One thing that you'll find in Python is that it's relatively easy to um, actually be typing a Python program and then to wonder outside of the constraints of the grammar of that language. And then you'll have a syntax error. And syntax errors uh, feeds directly into uh, debugging Python programs. And so uh, if you uh, make a mistake in typing, uh, you know, here he gives a good example of something that is grammatically nonsensical. So, 
P does of 3 plus equals 5. Okay? Now, I, this does not make sense because it doesn't follow any kind of a grammar that we would understand mathematically. You certainly can't pretend that this 5 is an assignment operator because you can't change the value of 3 to 5. And then even if you did, there's this plus over here. Okay, which doesn't make sense. And then if you decide to chunk this up in such a way to where you think that it is like some sort of increment by assignment operator, it still doesn't make sense because you still can't add five to three and make three five more. So this is a grammatical nonsense statement. Okay, uh, for those of you who worked in programming, uh, wondering outside the grammar of your language is something that probably happens occasionally. And the more that you get used to the language that you're working in, the less likely you'll actually wonder outside of the grammar. Uh, the reason why these languages need such tight grammars is because natural languages are ambiguous. If I said, yeah, I went there, okay? Very few people would understand where I actually went Okay, when I went, how I went, whatever. Computers are incredibly literal machines. They need to have so many of the details spelled out. It is true that we have some advances in things like natural language processing, but for the most part, if you're programming, you're using it with an incredibly literal language. Okay? Uh, redundancy? So, Natural languages are ambiguous. So when you're ambiguous, what do you do? You ask what? You clarify. You say the same thing in two or three different ways. Once you get it across, your point across in all of these different ways, then you wind up getting a real idea of like, what were the conditions? When he said he went there, no, he meant he drove there. He's talking about traffic, stuff like that, okay? Inside a programming language, these things are generally laid out up front because the computer is not going to have the kind of interrogation or back and forth with the developer in order to figure out what to do. It's, it's incredibly liberal. Okay. And now he's talking about liberal. So we already covered that. Um, who here understands the difference between poetry, prose, and uh, programmers? He's fun when you're writing a program. Yeah, he's trying to make an analogy about the spectrum of languages. Okay, so basically some languages written by people who are much better at English than I, um, you know, you can come up with beautiful poetry where you're using the words for your sounds, okay, as opposed to the means. You can move to prose where the meaning of the words becomes more important, the structure contributes more, and eventually you can move to programs where basically the only thing that really drives the entire movement of the program is the, is the grammar. And then finally we'll get into debugging. And debugging is this inevitable problem of when you've got a computer that is so literal, almost every time you write down exactly what it is that you thought that you needed it to do, you will find out that you were somehow not specific enough. <laughs> you didn't realize that when they typed in age, some enterprising young person would decide to type in negative five. You know, or you'll you know you'll realize that uh, you know data validation. Even if you've got data validation, uh, you might have forgotten uh, certain facts about how floating point numbers divide. And uh, that means that you may make particular mistakes. And the art of removing the mistakes from the program that you've uh, written is called debugging. It is an important art. There are several techniques to do it. Um, the simplest way that a lot of people start off with is simply printing out lots of values, either to a log file or to the screen, uh, so they can checkpoint as the program's going along. At least on this line, I understand what's happening. But it is possible to uh, debug in many other ways, including using uh, environments that will allow you to set breakpoints and just inspect the program as it is running, and halt the program, and possibly even <coughs> modify those uh, values as you move forward. 
So we've got a little bit of vocabulary here, and um, but all of this vocabulary is pretty darn close to English. So I'm going to gloss over it a little bit. There's only one detail that I didn't really cover in depth, which is high and low level languages. Okay, uh, you'll hear this from time to time, but high level languages are basically languages that are more adaptable to human beings to write and read. And low level languages are languages that require less processing before the computer can actually execute them. Okay, Python is considered a high level language. Most of it looks pretty darn close to uh, something that you could read. A good example of a low-level language would be, say, like assembly, or some would argue fourth is right on the border. So print statement is a function that we'll cover in Python, and it basically allows Python to display something uh, to the screen. Um, operators operate on particular values. We talked about types. We talked about a few of the kinds of types. We talked about the differences between natural languages and formal languages. And uh, token is something that we glossed over, but a token is the basic element of a formal language. So that means that if we're talking about integers, the entire integer will probably be contained in this concept that the Python interpreter is using called a token. Okay? And you, the Python interpreter can then like, realize that this is an integer. And this is not just like five characters typed together. And it can start dealing with it at a higher level in order to try to stuff it into uh, the grammar uh, uh, parser. And so now we've covered the uh, first chapter of the book, and this is a really easy chapter. It's all high-level stuff, but uh, are there any questions? Okay, sure. So when you type in a program, that program goes through a process before it executes. Okay, and when I say a process, I mean a procedure. <coughs> procedure will read the characters that are typed in or the characters that are coming off of the disk. And generally speaking, it, it reads it in some order. Order, depending upon the language, it might read it from right to left or from left to right. There are advantages to both. So even if you're reading the language in one direction, your uh, interpreter or compiler might be reading it in another. This print here is a name of a function somewhere inside the Python interpreter. So rather than it trying to keep track of one, two, three, four, five different characters, what it is going to do is at one stage of the processing, I mean, it's going to read in five characters, but at one stage of the processing, it's going to take these five characters and say, this is one thing, okay? This is a token. So basically, if you were to do this would this be the same? Yes. Awesome. Let's round it out. Would that be the same? Yeah, that's a that's no problem. We we don't mind to <laughs> I right, because, because we don't have any conventions where we specify the sign of positive integers. And so Python's uh, grammar for handling math is not going to be able to handle the concept of adding a explicitly positive 3. Okay? <laughs> uh, likewise, just finishing it out, this won't work either. There is a special rule. <coughs> because the negative token can be used as both an operator and as a value specifier, there's a special rule inside the grammar engine of Python to ensure that if it sees a negative value, it will attempt to assign it to the value unless it is the sole operator. Okay, and so you, you basically uh, 
get something that looks almost like the map that you would write in school. Yes? Um, the positives actually are working. Oh, they are? Mm -hmm. Maybe wrong. It well, happens. I kept trying. It kept working. It's a, it's a Python 3. Oh, it's a Python 3 type? <laughs> Uh, okay. It would be obvious to you that it was full. I am, I am, well, you know what? <laughs> you can tell me anything and I have to believe it until I prove it wrong. I'm, I'm not sure why 5 minus minus 3 is 8. But did they do that? You should correct me negative. Okay, so 5 minus, if I use parentheses, maybe it'll be clear. So if I were to include the, the parentheses here, in order to specify that the minus three is actually a negative three, okay. then I'm subtracting a negative number. It comes up with the same result as if I had added three. Okay. Yeah. I would have expected to be negative eight, like a minus minus together. So if it was three negative three. five minus negative eight, uh, minus three, I should say, then it certainly would be negative. But we're starting off over here with a positive 5. Okay. And then we're just bumping 3 back. Okay. All right. that we uh, do is in the scope of a program, we want to give a name to something, all right? So you want to put a name to a particular value. For example, here, they put the name message and they bind it to this value and now for something completely different. This equal sign does not mean a comparison equals like you might see in a math book. This equal sign uh, used in this format where you have a name of something or a storable reference. Uh, some people will call them L values. It is accepting a value into this name. If you later on use this variable message, it will resolve that to its last bound value. In this case, it'll resolve that to and now for something completely different. And you can say that you want to print the message. And then what will happen is you will print and now for something completely different. By the way, Python has a history, um, for those of you who don't know, it is named after the Monty Python group, and therefore you are going to see lots of Monty Python joke references. I hope that you enjoy them as much as the people who, who wrote them, something tells you. Of a variable for it doesn't have some languages? Yes, um, you can call it dereferencing, and it's perfectly appropriate. So if we were to uh, use, say, n equals 17 as, what is it? Um, sorry, I am not very good at open the back typing. So <laughs> n equals 17, and then you want to print n, you will see that it prints 17. What has happened is I've used this variable n to hold a value, and then I've later used the variable and pull the value uh, out of it by dereferencing the variable. So you don't have to put any kind of like special character token on the front of it when you reference it later, like a dollar sign or master. Uh, no, not in Python. Okay, um, there are some programming languages like Perl where they have sigils that are special character tokens that indicate whether they're like you know lists or whatever. But in Python, uh, there is no need for that. So, so you have to be careful that you differentiate what could be a variable or a string by putting the string in the uh, open and close quotes, whereas the variable just throw it in the quotes. Well, you can't really assign a value to a value. So if you were to quote in, here, let me show you. I mean to say that if you did a print function, and you didn't, you didn't. So you do a print function. You, if you put message as a variable in quote, it would just print message. But if you 
without quotes, it just prints whatever you said message as a variable. Uh, right, so to try to keep reusing my same variable, but demonstrate what you're talking about, printing in will print 17, whereas printing <coughs> the actual value in will print the actual value in. Okay, so uh, this will uh, basically allow you to determine the differences between uh, the, the value and the variable. And remember our type operation? If we do type of n, it will actually return back the value of the type, the type of the value stored in n. And uh, Python is dynamically typed, which means that if we wanted to do something like, say, n equals hello, and then we wanted to print out the type of n, you will see that it actually inspects at runtime the type of value. So this is a runtime type inference system. It is not, um, you know, like a static system. If you're used to static languages, once you declare a variable with a type in a static language, you cannot reuse that variable with a different type. And uh, just to put the last detail on it, if we print it out now, it prints out the value hello. Okay, how are you doing? Good, yeah. Doing well. <laughs> um, did anybody need something to drink and not get it? Because we do have refrigerators with drinks in them. I know we announced it before, but some people came in late. So I just want to make sure that if you've got something that you would like to drink, uh, by all means, it's available. <coughs> and uh, any of the canned sodas inside the fridges, they're, they're fine to, to take and drink. Okay, so variable names. We've talked about uh, variables and how they work and how there are ways of naming values. We need another chair? Let me make sure. started off on them, how there are ways that we can name values. They, they assign places inside the computer to hold the values, and these values can be changed and updated over time. Um, but what we didn't do is we didn't talk about the details of variable names. Uh, it is possible to actually have variables that are not permitted, okay? Names that you might want to name a variable that are not allowed. And this has to do with that whole uh, grammar and parsing that's underneath the covers, all right? For example, if you decide to use a variable name that begins with a number, this is not permitted in Python, okay? You can put a number at the end, you can put an underscore and a number at the end or whatever, but you can't actually start it with a number. And so you'll get a syntax error because it does not recognize this 76 trombones as a variable. Okay, it's going to uh, start off thinking that you're probably talking about a number, and then it'll be like, well, you know, there's no digit T in a number, something's wrong. Uh, and uh, again, uh, you can also use uh, various special characters that are not permitted within variable names. Now, for the most part, people generally use pretty mundane variable names. If you stick to like the letters underscore, and then possibly numbers, as long as they're not first, you're safe within Python, as you are in most languages. Um, but there are also variables that look like they should be valid, but are not. For example, this looks like valid syntax for assigning advanced theoretical Zymergy, the art of brewing beer, into the variable class. Okay, unfortunately, the variable class cannot exist in Python because class is a special, uh, 
kind of token. It's a keyword. It's part of the language. It specifies that you're actually going to be defining the class. And so there's a reserved set of words that you can never use as a variable name. Okay? Some of these, it's really obvious why they're reserved. Others, it'll come as we learn more of the language. For example, false. You cannot assign anything to false because false is used as the value in Python that is awesome. Okay? <laughs> you know, and uh, true, likewise, is? True. Probably true. Probably true. Okay, well, you know, if your probability is 1.0, you're absolutely right. Okay? Uh, but Python also has a couple of other interesting values like none. Okay? Uh, some of you have worked in other programming languages and you've heard of like things like void. Okay? Which is sort of like a tight placeholder when you don't really want a value. Okay? None has a similar relationship, but we will get into the actual details of, of none in Python later. And, and uh, capitalization is important there, right? So. Yes, capitalization is important. Um, now, so lowercase false, okay. Well, the, um, I don't know, I've never tried to do anything that crazy. It was <laughs> out true. Uh, I doubt it would be okay. If it's not okay, then, uh, then, you know, we'll write right here. Yeah. Yeah, you can use the lower case. Uh, yeah, I'm glad. Yeah. Sorry. My C is just coming back. So, can you do it without the adit? There's a space in front. There was a space in front? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have yeah. space in front. False. I didn't think that there was a space in front, but, you know. <coughs> so, fault, lower case false is fine as a variable name. I highly recommend <laughs> for the ease of you reading your own program in the future <laughs> that you never use the lowercase variable false or the lowercase variable true. Unless you're trying to make it count your spells. <laughs> no, not even when you're trying to mess with yeah, it. Yeah, this one day will be me, so you just don't want to do it. Yes. This gets at something, if we can step back from all the languages, the difference between a value and a variable. Oh, that is just a minute. It works. I mean, we obviously know that you can use the variable to kind of pin down the value or tell it where it's going to be stored away but that's again could you just hold forth on this a little bit what's the difference sure so a value is something that can be stored inside the computer it can be, and a variable is a name that you might associate with that value mm -hmm. so in so other big, words so being stored that's the difference though. It, it's not so much about the storage because it doesn't really matter if it's stored or not. The point is, is that sometimes you want to name a value. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. No. And when you want to name a value, the mechanism by which you will name this value is you will store it into a variable. Okay. You will assign the value yeah. to the variable. And that means that when I use this variable false later on, it will print out this value A. But where, where, where is it? Is that worth asking? I mean, you write you write the word Mary, and that's going to be your your Mary. variable, and so the computer has to go look somewhere, doesn't it? Or well, because this is a programming language that understands these variables, when I use this name without quotes, without quotes, because that's different. <laughs> it, when I use this name it is going to find the value for me. Yeah, but it itself, does it get stored? Does it have to be found? It's a memory. Yes, I mean, the computer will hold it between the time that I assign it to the variable and the time that I pull it back out of the variable, all right? And it'll get held somewhere within the computer. And that storage, whether that storage occurs in a particular location or not, is dependent upon a whole bunch of things. But the values and the variables are both stored or not. 
I mean, they have to be stored or something. Yeah, they have to be. I mean, the variable name has to be stored, but it's treated differently by Python. The name has to be stored, so when I use the name again, it can recognize that I'm using a name that is in active use, okay? And the value has to be stored because when I decide to find whatever is stored underneath this variable name, yeah, yeah. it has to pull the value back out. So both of them are stored, but this doesn't always mean very much to you um, when it comes down to having to worry about the, the particular names. As we get into the uh, variables, you'll saw, find that even though they're both, even though, like I mentioned, they're both stored, they might not always be accessible, depending upon something that we will uh, cover in a few more um, uh, slides called scope. Okay? Okay, just one, one more pass. You get your definition of a function and you use for the parameter some kind of a variable. When you call the function, you can use a variable, but you can also use a value straight out, right? Right, so we haven't talked about functions yet, but you can pass a variable into a function call. And when you pass that variable into the function call, it's not really the variable's name that gets passed in. The variable gets resolved to its value and the value gets passed. But All right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and we want to cover that when we get to that section, okay. if you don't mind. Okay, okay. so, um, and part, are we taking questions in the class? Or we oh, I'm sorry, I missed one. I told you, so sorry, I very, very much, I just took a second down, but I was trying to look this up earlier. Um, how do you get, what's about you press to indent it? So in the past I was running, it was run instead of indent, when you're going to line up, what button are you pressing to indent the code? Okay. So okay. in um, Python, you can use uh, space yeah. or tab to indent. But generally speaking, because programmers deal with spaces more easily than they deal with tabs, mm -hmm. um, I would recommend <coughs> only using spaces. Like two, pressing two or three, I'm wondering there is a standard version of, can get the version that, and there's a... So when Python sees that something is indented, mm -hmm. it finds out what it's being indented by. And as long as the remaining lines are indented by the same thing, it treats those lines as a cohesive block of code. Let me add something else to that. A lot of people in this class are going to be using PyCharm. PyCharm is the idea that we're officially going to be using uh, more or less to keep everyone on the same page. With PyCharm, if you type code, you can select that code and just simply hit tab, and it'll take care of all the more details. All you got to do is look at it and say, does my stuff line up? If it's not far enough indented, Select it, hit tab, and it'll bring it up to that indentation level. If it's too far <coughs> indented, I believe you hold shift and hit tab, it brings it back, right? So to answer your question, if you're using PyCharm, the only thing you gotta do is select the code and hit tab until it looks pretty and like everyone else's code. Yeah. And and that's kind of even, I mean, that's really what programming is with Python. Yeah. Well, who, who's dealt with a programming language that uses lots of curly braces to, to start and stop blocks? Yes. This will be the biggest challenge or you with Python. You're used to having those tokens to say when your block ends or, or begins, <coughs> ends. Um, in some languages like COBOL, it actually says begin and end, okay? Uh, but the point is, is that you are used to those, those markers around your blocks. This doesn't exist in Python. It's one of the more controversial choices <coughs> the language made. The language decided that indentation controls your block structure, and so, if you're a person that likes to use two spaces to indent, it's not going to get pulled because it's looking at relative indentation. The subblock is indented more than the block above it. The superblock is indented less than the block, you know, uh, below it. So um, this is something to, to be aware of in Python. And uh, PyCharm definitely has a lot of features to make sure that your indentation is taken care of for you. Because uh, really, it's not very fruitful to sit there and like actually type four spaces in front of everything for 20 lines. So the uh, do by all means use the tab feature. You can also use like F8. Yeah. Well, I mean, I there's a lot of techniques for formatting your code, but keep in mind that because a lot of people have treated formatting 
as simply presentational. It doesn't actually affect execution of the code. In Python, changing your indentation, if you change it wrong, okay, it'll actually affect the flow of the code. So um, we're also, we kind of covered expressions a little bit. Expressions are those little snippets of ideas that are not full sentences. So like, you know, n plus three, n plus 25, they can be evaluated out to a value. Yeah. And this is one of the things that's very important with expressions. I'm, I'm moving on because we've killed variables. I don't know why I can say about variables that hasn't been said already. Uh, but the expressions, basically, you can put variables into them, and they generally evaluate into uh, values. A uh, good example right here, this can stand completely on its own because it's a statement, it has an effect, it changes the state of the program. Expressions generally do not. For example, n plus 25 does not change the value of n. Okay, this is not add 25 to n, this is take the value of n and add 25 to it. And because you're in the REPL, it'll just display the, the result of the expression. REPLs can always take expressions um, but over here, this statement changes the state of the program. If I were to stop after this line, whatever n was before, it's now 17. So script mode. Most of the time when you're programming, you're not actually going to be typing into the command line like I am doing right now. Uh, if you take a look, you see that I've been walking through the examples by typing in things like, you know, 4 plus 6, or B plus 6, sorry, 4 plus 6. And this is great for, like, showing you a very basic idea. But nobody types their program in to solve the problem because we're not that great typists. So one of the things that Python does is it supports something that they uh, call script mode, and what script mode is, is what 95% of your programs uh, will do. I mean, basically what you're doing is um, storing a sequence of statements into a file. And then when you load that file up, it will evaluate those statements. And um, order of operations, back when you took math, you learned that you need to do your multiplications before you do your addition. <coughs> All of the keywords, functions, everything that's inside Python has an order of operation, okay? So that means that certain operations will be performed first, and then other operations will be performed later, even if those operations are on the same line simply because there's a certain precedence and certain operations naturally should be performed first, otherwise you don't get the expected result. Uh, a good example is the uh, five times six plus three. If I evaluate this six plus three first, I'll probably get a result that will make every math teacher shudder. Um, but <laughs> if I evaluate this result first, I'll probably be in alignment with most of the people who made it out of high school. So, you know, the point is, is that uh, these orders of operations have to do with how the interpreter evaluates the current state of your program and what function it's going to perform next, which order it's going to uh, proceed. Uh, Now, we've mostly dealt with uh, things like uh, math operations because a lot of us have a common background in basic mathematics and algebra. It's very easy to understand uh, math operations, but there are other operations too, okay? For example, math, um, you know, is great for when you're dealing with numbers, but occasionally you'll need to deal with text, and text is typically stored in strings. And so there are string operations, and some string operations really don't make any sense. For example, even though this looks like two minus one, this is not two minus one, this is the string containing two minus 
the string containing one. Okay. Now in this case, there is actually uh, no really sensible way of performing a subtraction between strings because the contents of these strings are not numbers, they're characters. So I cannot subtract the character one off of the character two any more than I can divide the string eggs by the string easy. There's no numeric equivalent to these operations for strings. Again, multiplication, it doesn't work. But there is one caveat, and that is that Python, much like many of the languages before it, has decided to use the addition sign in order to make it easy to describe a particular operation with strings. If you uh, are concatenating strings, you're basically joining them such that the first string's value is at the beginning of the result, and the second string's value is at the end. So if I say I have a string called hello, and a second string called, well, not called, but the value of there, and I use this concatenation operation, as this operator gets evaluated, I will come up with a string, hello there. Now, I would like to point out that there is no space in between these two. It is not understanding of any language. It's just going to simply supplant the two strings together. Can you have more than two? Yes, you can. But you would have to include additional yeah, yeah. operators to join them. Now, <coughs> Python also uses the asterisk operator in order to indicate repetition. So you could say ho times three, and then you get your proverbial ho, ho, ho Christmas tree. Okay? But this only works because Python understands that this times three, it has an integer on one side. The previous example where I was talking about you couldn't actually <coughs> multiply two strings together, it's because it doesn't see this as an integer value. And between the repetition symbol and the concatenation symbol for strings, those are the two major uh, operations that you'll perform. If you use other operations, you'll probably wind up using the uh, <coughs> object interface and doing a, a call through it. The last thing that we'll cover uh, real quick before we start getting into uh, the functions is the comments. And occasionally, when you're writing a program, it's useful to leave a helpful note for when you read this program later, okay? And uh, helpful <coughs> notes don't get in why we're computing the first page. And comments don't have to be on a single line. I mentioned that this hash symbol or, is it hash? Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. This hash symbol at the beginning renders the whole line as a comment. You can also put the comment at the end of the line. Now, you can't put the comment in the middle of something you want the compiler to execute because once it sees that hash, it'll treat whatever that leftover piece of what you want to execute as part of the comment. Another uh, good guideline on comments is please don't put code in your comments because people, uh, after a while, they see the patterns of reading code and then they will actually start thinking that that comment did something functional in the program because it looks exactly like programming code, when in reality it doesn't. But you could use a comment to comment out, comment out code if you're like, mm, problematic. I don't want to run this right now or there's a bug in this. It's, it's possible to do it. Um, generally speaking, I really don't like that approach. Instead, what I usually wind up doing is I will usually wind up wrapping it in like an if false statement. But the uh, difficulty with Python is that its blocks are indented. So yes, you'll probably wind up using a, a few comments in order to comment out code. But you know that's while you're working with the code. At some point in time, you, you shut the code down. When you shut the code down and save it or uh, check it into your source code control system, hand it off to another developer or whatever, please, by all means, have, have commented out code to me. You know, it's just, it's really not. Um, and then debugging. We've seen a couple of times due to my really lousy typing, syntax errors. 
syntax errors basically indicate that the interpreter does not understand what you just did. The art of changing what you just did into something that you really meant to do and you really wanted the interpreter to understand is debugging, okay? If you get a syntax error, all right, in any step of your program, Python won't know how to pick up the pieces in advance, okay? It doesn't try to like say, oh, well, you know, maybe that wasn't important because the Python really doesn't make any of these judgment value calls. And so your program will stop, all right? You'll learn over time, and uh, PyCharm also has some assistive measures to keep you from uh, writing too much stuff that's outside of the range of correct Python programs. Uh, runtime errors, however, are different, okay? So like a syntax error, you usually see one of those right up front. As soon as the module is loaded, whatever, Python's going to indicate that this is a problem. All right? Runtime errors are different. Runtime errors have to do with doing something illegal with the values in your computer. Okay? For example, just because it's a computer program, they still haven't figured out how to do this. Okay? <laughs> Computers are advanced, but they're not advanced enough to divide zero. Wait, other way, other way. Strike that, reverse it. Thank you very much. Okay, so the first one they can do just fine. <laughs> very easy for them to cut it in the first one. Apparently, the first one it's hard for me to do yeah. just right. But anyway, uh, but no, seriously, computers haven't figured out how to divide by zero yet. Um, this would be a runtime error. Uh, now, if you typed it directly in, it'd get caught right away. But usually, these things don't get caught right away. Usually you have something like a variable that's assigned to some sort of whatever input, and then eventually somewhere down there you wind up using it, like, you know, five divided by n. And so these things can get into the program even if the program is syntactically correct. So you need to put guard statements around uh, certain things that are known to raise runtime errors and have some sort of sensible way of handling them inside your application. <coughs> And then the semantic errors. Semantic errors are um, basically when the program doesn't actually solve the problem. Okay. For example, if you were to say, deposit some money at the bank and it withdrew it, as opposed to depositing it, or it deposited the wrong amount of money, or if you were to say, purchase an item, and you know, not due to the mistake of the people in the shipping department, but due to the mistake inside the computer, it decides to ship you the wrong item. Okay? These are semantic errors. These are errors in the meaning of the program. The program solves the wrong problem. All of these kinds of errors come into play in debugging. Hopefully, semantic errors are ones that you encounter less often than the other ones, but usually there are the harder ones to work out in an established code base because it means that by the time that you fix the core of the problem, uh, you usually have a lot of extra code that assumes this problem. And so you would have to go through and debug the entire application for corrections. And um, that pretty much covers variables. And so now if you wanted to pop open your laptops and see whether or not you can use your Python <coughs> interpreters, okay, you can see that uh, N42 is a legal statement. What do you think happens when you do 42 equals n? Syntax error. Yeah, you can't start it with uh, You can't make an assignment to a little. Very, well, I hear two things and they're both correct. That's the wonderful thing about languages. You cannot assign a value to a literal because the literal is its value, okay? And it's a syntax error because it's a variable that starts with a number, okay? And uh, both of these things are correct. They're just different ways of saying the same thing. Who wants to see if you can do x equals y equals 1? <laughs> Without the question mark, it's OK. Probably why you can't have two assignments on one line. You can. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it does x x plus y equals one thing that but it doesn't try. Well, before you before you do it. But before it's you do it. Two different assignments. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I swear, I'm like really I'm angry. sensitive in typing. I'm gonna get his laptop to work on the TV before the next class. <laughs> I'm doing the next one, by the way, and then the one after that, we're gonna have this the laptop TV thing. Okay. So I know that some of you have actually started typing in, and I really hope that you've got your REPL up and that you know the answer to this. Who knows the answer? Because I don't want to spill the beans for those people. Okay, right. if you if you if you already know the answer, put your hands down and let's let everyone else guess, and it'll be funny. Yeah. Who thinks it's gonna work? work? Like Raise it. your hands. So I'm not getting it. Work. Who says y is going to be equal to one? Who says x is going to be equal to y? Who says x is going to be equal to y? Sorry. Yeah, I got that pattern thing going. Did not keep one. Why one? One got assigned to x and y. So you can just keep stringing them along, and, and whatever the last input is is essentially what the okay. everyone gets. Right. So. So I'll show you. First, let's let's do the simple stuff. Okay. So let's print x. Okay. Let's print y. And then, just for fun, let's print one. Okay. Now I will explain why this works. Remember, we talked about precedence. Okay. So in chains of assignment operators, which one do you think is going to evaluate first? Do you think we're going to set the value of y to x first, and then set the value of y to 1? Who goes for that? No. It's a decent answer. No. Do you think that we're going to set the value of y to 1, and then set the value of x yeah. to y? Yeah. OK. They're both decent answers. Depending upon the programming language, it actually could change. However, in this case, what happens is there is a right precedence in chain assignment operators. So the value at the end has to be a value, okay, or a variable that holds a value. And it will set as if it were parentheses. Now, this is not valid Python because you can't use parentheses in this context, but it will set it as if there were parentheses. And then it will take the assigned value of y and chain that forward. Okay? And uh, this means that like, if you need to initialize a lot of things, you'll see sometimes at the top of a block of code in Python, x equals y equals z equals 0, and then that'll just set them all to 0. Okay. Um, personally, my style of programming, I don't mind typing in the extra line. I know some people are like really sensitive about how many extra characters they have to type. Uh, just be aware of both ways that you can change. Uh, just be aware of the assignment chaining, simply because you'll see it sooner or later. And then if you don't understand it, then you know, you'll have to look it up. Sorry, Dave. When you're programming yourself, you almost always go for readability over less typing yourself? Personally, yes, because in the long run, I find that, and I'm not alone in this, but there are other people who could have different opinions. I find that in the long run, you wind up reading your program many more times than you wind up typing it. And so you'll wind up going back and trying to figure out what a block of code is doing. And the last thing that you want to do is figure out how clever you were when you wrote that block of code. Okay, because if you are incredibly clever, then you have to be that clever to read it. And the truth is, is that like when you're writing it, you may have this brilliant idea, but you know, two weeks down the line, you've got different brilliant ideas rolling around in your head. You probably won't remember that brilliant trick. So by all means, write boring code. Yeah. It'll make your life much easier. <laughs> Unless you're writing assembly, <laughs> then bigger <laughs> code. <laughs> if you're writing assembly, um, I think you're already in a point where you're really writing for performance <laughs> for the machine.
Anyone else have any technical errors? We had one take around the last time. Point at me, and I'll come and we'll get you all set up. somewhat in subject matter. Uh, so they, they've allowed us, they've given us a shout out in their class, they've allowed us to post on their meetup.com page. If you are more advanced than this, certainly, by all means check out their meetup. You meet Desio, which is right next to uh, Central Market. Good guys, good, good meetups. Uh, they cover stuff slightly more high level, a lot of lightning talks. They usually have one main feature, five to 10 minutes, check it out, it's a cool community. There's another Python group out here. Uh, well, it's not specifically Python, but it's called uh, Girls Who Code or uh, Women Who Code. It's on meetup.com. Uh, by all means, check them out if that's something you're into. They have also, I've used, I've announced this group on, on their meetup.com page. They were cool with us too. If you're going to go down Python, check out both of those, you know, if they fit. And also there's one other group too called Data Visualization. And there's a lot of people in this group that are for data visualization or wanting to get into that field. There's a data viz group in Houston. And one of the things that that data viz group does is they uh, they have these things called data jams once a month where they give you code and then we try to make sense of their code and visualize that code. And uh, I see some faces in here from that group, but if you want to get into data visualization, check out them. They're also on meetup.com. Yeah. Are you a developer? Yeah. 
understand what 7.5016 hours is so there is something that we can do about this all right remember we talked about types you can actually change the type of the answer to some degree through something called casting and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify that I want the int portion of this answer. And now if I print it out, I get a nice clean seven hours. So it's 7 a.m. We're still eating breakfast. Hasn't been dinner yet. Of course, if my knee goes out on me the way that it's feeling today, then it would be different. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so what we're trying to do is now we want the finished minutes, which We can also express as a formula. Finished minutes is the finished time with the seconds for the seven hours subtracted off. Of course, if we print that out, that's also going to give us fractional minutes. All right. Six seconds. Did I miss something? We got 
six, yeah, well, there's six, six seconds in there. There's six seconds in there, but. Oh, I forgot to, it's still in seconds, yeah. Thank you very much. One of the nice things about Rebels is that you can just press up arrow and uh, get whatever it was that you intended to type before. Uh, who can remember what kind of syntax error, uh, what kind of error this was? Semantic. Semantic, yeah. Semantic, yeah. It's when I mess up. Okay, so divided by 60, and now if I print out the finished minutes, you can see that I'm at 30.1, but you know, we just want the integer of that. So it's at 7.30, and for those of you who can do the math without typing it all out, yes, it's 7.30 and six seconds. Okay. I expected the solution to be easier than that. Can we do date? Uh, can we do time uh, operations? As soon as we start talking about date libraries and start pulling them in, but right now we haven't talked about importing a wizard. Okay. So the, the thing is, is that, you know, you'll know. <laughs> okay, so let's get into the last one that we uh, intend to cover today. And we've been moving a little bit slow because we wanted to make sure that we really got the fundamentals down. But uh, if you need to pass parameters in and out of the function, and the way that we do that is through the parameter list is a function called int, and it converts a string to an integer. But not all strings can be converted to integers. So remember, programs have conditional execution. If you pass in what is the int value of hello, you'll get, who knows what you'll get, but you'll definitely not get an integer. <laughs> you'll get an error, all right? Whereas if you pass in what is the int value of 3.999, this function understands that you've passed in a float value and it will draw the remainder part. This is not a rounding function. This is an integer value function. It truncates the remaining value. Okay? Likewise, it's not uh, it's it's not going to do uh, any kind of negative rounding, scientific rounding, anything like that. It's just going to truncate the fractional value, even if the fractional value is in a negative direction. Okay, so this is not like a floor function which will go to lowest value. Because if it was a floor function, then it would go to negative three. Okay, this is just a chop. You lose the decimal point. Okay? Likewise, we can pass to the function float an integer. And we'll get a floating point value back. And we can pass a string and we'll get, a, if it's possible, a floating point representation of the string. And finally, because we've talked about floats <coughs> and strings, there's the string function for you, and pretty much all of the number values have a valid string representation. So you can convert almost any string, uh, any number into a string. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how you actually access functions. Functions populate a namespace. They, they have names that are inside your environment. And you need to get those names inside your environment because otherwise you can't reference them. You need to call them by name. And so what you have is you have this import statement. And this import statement, it takes a token. All right, this token is the name, but this token is the name of a module, all right? And it is going to search for this module, and if it finds something that provides this module, then it will include all of the names underneath this module inside your program space. And you can actually call these things. So before, there is no log base 10 function. But here, they included the module math, and then they could take the log base 10 of a value by saying underneath math, the function log base 10, and I'm passing this ratio in. Does somebody have any confusion about how this is working in the language? Nope. Okay. So you can't reference the function if you don't 
import it. Unless it's uh, a built-in that's already in the namespace. Those are very few. Print is one of those. Okay, so you don't have to import print because that's actually in the default namespace. But the math function, you would have to uh, you would have to basically import the math function. So real quick, if we say, well, first let's do math the sine of one. You'll see there's an error. It says I have no idea what you just typed. In. Okay, I can tell the syntax, but there there's no math thing. Okay. But if I were to import math, okay, and then if I were to say, hey, what is the value of math now to think about it? It says, hey, the value of math is an object <coughs> that you loaded from this file. Okay? And then if I were to do the same command that I did previously, it'll say, hey, the sign of one is 0.84. And the square root of 2 divided by 2. Is there a quick way to get a list of all the functions that are included within something you import? Is that like, or is it just a matter of go look at the documentation? Um, you know, it's a good question because I never really look at it that way. I usually go looking for a function, and then when I find the, the you know, function that I need, I import the module. And it's very rare that after pulling up the documentation for the function that I need, I don't know what I'm importing. Um, but I'll find an answer for that, and I'll, I'll send it to you, no problem. Well, it's trivial, but it's interesting, because it does have some implementation. Yes? If you type the math dot, it will show a list of Ah, thank you. Through uh, syntax completion, or just? I think on top of so this is interesting, you're, you're absolutely right. So the REPL environment is basically checking to see all of the exported uh, methods off the math object. And so by pressing math.tab, the tab completion engine will basically print the rest of the items out. Of course, that won't work if you're working inside uh, just flat files, unless you're using an IDE that provides that kind of completion. And so now, instead of having to reference all of those weird almost pies, <laughs> we can actually just call an at pi, and it has a value of pi defined for us. question but for the arguments in a function is there an easy way to figure out what possible arguments go into each function so since python is dynamically typed at most i would hope that you get the name that is provided with the function prototype but uh if it's done it's done through your ide completion engine or your your development environment let me find out real fast because like i said I do it the other way, where I have the documentation of what the function is. So I, I never really try this tab of completion stuff. Um, so I'm good. My tab no, completion doesn't work. It just it just basically says that I'm trying to take the sign of a bunch of tabs. And it just this is it. You're welcome. But it does tell you the uh, the error mm -hmm. on an error. So you can see that sign takes exactly one argument. Um, and that's important because there are functions that bind differently based off of the number of arguments you pass them. Right. Yes. And uh, so like arity is easy, but I would imagine that since most environments wind up erasing the parameter names, because they, they, when they're compiled out for the interpreter, those parameter names are not always particularly useful. I haven't checked to see what Python 3 is. Okay, I, I need to find out. 
So let's find out. <laughs> so it's telling me my type <laughs> that it needs to be, but it's not saying anything about the uh, the name that might have been provided by it. So composition, when you look at the elements in isolation, you know, you're just evaluating expressions inside your rectal engine, you get answers real fast. But when you actually want to combine these elements, there are rules because we have that entire grammar that we need to follow. And the rules generally indicate that some things are permitted and other things are not. It is perfectly valid to call a function within the parameter list of another function. What will happen is the innermost function will be evaluated first. Or in this case, even this innermost function, the expression within it will be evaluated first. So whatever x was, we'll get one added to it. And then we will take the log of this. And then we will take the exponent of this. And then we will assign that back to x, OK? This nesting is uh, pretty natural for combining like statements onto the same line. Okay, how can uh, it can be overdone. Be, Don't put your whole program on. How can line. x be both the variable and the ah the parameter? Because this is not an equality statement. No, this is but. an assignment operator. So it will read x first to evaluate the x plus one. And then it will perform these math operations, and then it will assign the resulting value of these math operations to x. But where will it, it, it will get that right-hand x unless it, there's a call, will it? So x might so start as, a, suppose x starts as one. That takes, uh, what that does is it adds one to one, and then does the log of that, and then the exponent no, 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 of that. Uh, what, where do you get the one? X was x is is started started all just one. In this example, the line above has x being set. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, okay. okay, okay. But I the point is, is that you're right. If x was not defined, then it would have no value to read, and it would complain. Okay. This means that certain things can't be done, since the equal sign is an assignment operator. Even though you and I can figure out how to do the proper conversion to make this equality hold, this is not an equals operator. This is an assignment operator. Mm -hmm. So I cannot assign minutes to some compound expression. Okay, I can assign it to a variable because variables will provide us with storage, but I can't assign it to hours times 60. And, um, <coughs> what is considered valid to assign to has a name in the industry of an L value. It's a left-hand side value. Anything that eventually collapses to a value can be on the right-hand side. So sometimes they're called R values. It's not covered in this book, but if you ever hear L values and R values, they're talking about where it is valid in an assignment. Okay. So like you can access an L value to get some sort of actual stored value. All right? Sometimes there are certain kinds of L values that look like they have parameters in them that are okay. For example, array operators specify a specific offset, okay, in an array. We'll cover that later. So now that you know how to load functions, sometimes it's very useful to define some new functions. So what um, this does is this talks about the def keyword. Def is one of those things that you can't use as a variable because it's a keyword. Def allows you to define new things. In this case, we are defining a new function called print lyrics. The Python reference. They know that it is print lyrics. Uh, they know that it's a function because 
when you're defining it, it has a very specific syntax, including open and closing uh, uh, parentheses and a colon. And yes, I'm so glad that you noticed. <laughs> it is a Python reference <laughs> of the wrong kind. <laughs> So anybody who can sing the I'm a Lumberjack song, congratulations. <laughs> Keep that to yourself. And, uh, <laughs> and basically uh, what this does is this leverages Python's indentation block style. So this function that you're defining ends at the line after this print. Okay, it doesn't include the text below. <laughs> All right, but when you define this, you need to basically provide an extra blank line. I'll show you right now. Still defined. 
all right? If I try to redefine it. Oh, it's. Thanks. That's closure. There's nothing special about defining a function. It can be redefined. Why is there a colon there? Because this is part of the function definition syntax. Oh, that's okay. So, so the def indicates that I'm defining something. This has the signature of a function, and the colon indicates the beginning of the block okay. that will be uh, part of that function. So when we talk about um, defining functions, well, we're talking about names again, right? And so the rules for names still apply, all right? Letters, numbers and underscore are legal, but the first character can't be a number. All identifiers in Python will follow this rule. Again, you can't use keywords. And basically, uh, they're saying that the first line is called the header, which is Python-specific terminology, and the rest is called the body, all right? The header has to end with the colon, and the body has to be indented. Python is white space aware for its scoping. So it won't understand that the body is part of the header if the body is at the same indentation level as the White, white space is used, white, i sorry, I've got a accent, but white space <laughs> is anything that is not a character that's printed on the screen. So if you've got a tab, if you've got a uh, space, there are horrible things that shouldn't exist in computers called vertical tabs. Um, you know, if you've got various other things that used to be printer control codes, but they don't actually display on the screen, they're considered point of space. So if you like to use, say, tab to get your code in, because you like to set tab stops and you like to reformat your code and just have it all reformatted according to the tab, Python will understand that. Um, but if you like to use spaces because you open up your code in different environments and your tab stops are never the same in all the different environments, Python will understand that. The consistency is the key. If you put your code indented underneath something in Python, it will assume that all that code indented at the same level is part of the thing that's right underneath, or part of the block that's underneath that header. So, Going back here, this is a multi-line statement where the definitions of the top and these two prints are actually part of this definition. But they're not part of the header. No, but the header is a component of the definition. So like they're saying that this line right here, def print lyrics, is the header, and these two lines is the body. And all three of these lines is the function definition. Oh, fine. Now, remember how uh, I said that this is a name? The functions have this name? That name's the same as any other name. The only difference is, is that the value that's associated with it is executable code. Okay? So if you wanted to do a uh, print on it, it'll say, hey, this is some sort of uh, function over here at this piece of memory. Yeah, that's a memory address. Right? It is a memory address, okay? And then if you say, well, what type is it? You go, hey, this is a function type, okay? 
and uh, of course we've we've seen it uh, called and of course just in the same way that the function referenced the print function twice we can define another function that references this function multiple times and so here we're going to repeat the lyrics by simply defining a new function called repeat lyrics that calls print lyrics two times and when we run repeat lyrics we get, I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. I sleep all night and I work all day. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. I sleep all night and I work all day. 10, Frank, hello. 20, go to 10. <laughs> Use someone with no face. Okay. So this, um, right now, these functions are kind of not particularly interesting because Every time we call one of these functions, we have no way of doing one of the key components, which is conditional execution. I mean, we could just say copy the output, and all of the programs would produce the same output over and over until we get down to a point to where there is some change based on the input, and we actually get back different results. And so flow of execution, is a way in which you can basically map how code, how the interpreter will read your code and possibly move through it. And I say possibly move through it because during any one run, it might not move all the way through that block. But during uh, maybe another run later on, it might move through a different section of the code. So function definitions themselves don't alter the flow of the program. Well, okay. unless you're redefining function definitions all the time as part of your program, but please don't do that. <laughs> um, but, but a function call is like, um, you know, they call it a detour in the flow of execution, uh, but really it's almost like a summary. You've got a number of steps that you want to perform, but you want to perform them as a block. So let's say you were um, writing some sort of customer handling system you want to look up a customer that might be in your database. It might be very natural to have a function declare that will access your database and see whether or not an offered name is in the database. Okay? And if it is, it can return one thing. And if it's not, it might return something else. It might return an error. Or it might just return uh, that it's not there. So, when you have these functions call each other, what happens is, is they keep referencing the blocks of code that are assigned with their names. And so they keep performing the functions over, uh, performing the action defo defined underneath the function over and over again. And uh, in order for this to work, the interpreter has to keep track of which function you're in, which function you call, and which function it needs to return back to when the call is finished. For example, when we did that print example, level function meant that we were going to call the lower level function with this parameter high. It's going to go and find the block of code wherever it is in the system that's associated with that print and it's going to perform its operations there which will eventually make this high go onto the screen. When it's done it's going to return back just conceptually after this statement. Now, if I have another function over here, this function will jump into the same block of code, okay? But because it was called from this B over here, it's not going to return back 
to anything in A, it'll return back to the function that it called. And once you get to the end of the statement for a particular function, the function is said to complete, and whatever called this A is where the flow of execution will return. And so for flow of execution with functions, basically you enter the function and you may leave it by entering another function. But when you come out of that other function, you'll come back conceptually just after that statement. Yes? Oh, no problem. I use fingers to point. <laughs> All right. Oriented program. Hmm? Return oriented program. Right? No, it's not return oriented. <laughs> well, that would be a horrible program. But, <laughs> but I know you're pulling my leg because I know you know how to program. Okay, so <laughs> one interesting thing is that functions can take parameters. All right, now remember, Python's dynamically typed. So that means that any variable can hold any value at any given time. It'll hold the value that it had last assigned. So that means that if you're used to uh, other programming languages where you're statically typed, you would declare the type of the parameter. In Python, you don't do that. It's just the name. And whatever you pass to it is whatever you pass to it. But what you can do is you can use this name to pass values to other functions. This Bruce is the same as if somewhere in here it said Bruce equals whatever they gave me. Okay? And within this, this function, Bruce has the value of whatever somebody called. So if we were to define something like this print type, which I, uh, I'm going to actually risk trying to do in the Rebel engine again. <laughs> okay, so now I've uh, managed to define print device. <coughs> And so if I say print twice hello, you can see that it prints hello two times. Okay, that's because it will enter in here and this value hello will be bound to this variable thing. And then I'm using this variable thing two times calling it into print. And so this print here will print whatever I provided here, and then this print will provide whatever I had in here. It prints hello twice. But if I were to say print twice there, it does the same thing again. This assignment is not a permanent assignment. It lives only within the scope of this function call. Okay, so like when I left this function call, I can't find out what the value of thing was because I have actually destroyed the access to that particular variable. So actually do that, could you maybe stay where you were there and say, uh, go ahead and say print thing and it'll give you an error or unknown? No, yeah. just say print and then there you go. Okay, and so what it'll do is it'll tell me it doesn't know what a thing is. Right, because of the scope? Because of the scope? Of the scope. <coughs> because there is no variable thing. So, is that like a piece of quote, garbage collection that it just throws, so it basically covered that memory space? Or is that so it's not really garbage collection because we never had a thing for it to collect. What happens is this variable simply doesn't exist. Okay, okay, right. okay, now, during the evaluation of this function, it exists, and as this function returns, it ceases to exist. And so this thing doesn't exist at the top level, outside the function. 
Couldn't that have been an anonymously named parameter? Because like why call it anything if it if it's just a placeholder? So if there are some languages that don't require you to indicate what the parameters are, but Python does. It wants you to name it even though yeah, it needs a name because if you were to use it inside, yeah. then you would need yeah, make sure to have a name like for it. Something else or right, I mean, like, if I were to say, try to redefine this. but it won't fill right away, okay? Some languages are compiled. They have a lot of extra upfront work that goes through and reads your code looking for certain standard types of errors. Python is not a compiled language. Python is an interpreted language. For this to realize that there is an error, it has to run, okay? And so now if I say, do it, now, it'll say something like, hey, I was trying to do it, but there's this, that, and I have no idea what it is, and there's an error. Okay? So this means that like, when you're developing functions in Python, it's a really good idea for you to develop a small amount of test code to go if through that, all of the different that plugs. been in quotes, would it not have been a, a string and then an argument for the parameter thing? Now, if that had been in quotes, then it would be an actual value. And this function, whatever you passed it, yes. that thing, well, would always print the string that. Okay, so when you make a call, does the call, the call doesn't go look for the parameter, the parameter you say doesn't exist? When you make a call, this parameter, okay, gets mapped to the header. And the variables inside the function header, yeah get bound to the values that you pass through the parameter list, okay? But not because they're, a, they're not because thing is the variable for the value now, but because thing is the parameter of the function, and so it just says this function has a parameter, I don't know what the hell it is, I don't know anything about thing, but I know now that I'm supposed to put now. Yes, because the way that dynamic typing works is your variable takes on the type of the last thing that you assigned to it. Okay. And that is basically just the feature of a Python language. Yes? So if you go back to your earlier one where you've got to find print twice thing, right? and you successfully put that in, you've got the double print statement. Right. You then say thing, thing equals edit and then go back and try to hit print twice thing. Does it work? Does this thing now been hijacked by? So if I were to say thing equals uh, Edwin, okay, now I've declared a thing in my top level scope. And so print twice, use this, if I say print twice Bob, it's going to print the Bob twice. Because even though this variable now is declared in two different scopes, they are not the same variable. The variable that's in one environment is not the same variable that is inside the scope of a function call. The function declaration effectively hides this top level variable. So function, it can, it effectively, can, there's two of them in there, and if we know how to access them, we can get at them. Yes, there's two of them in there, and if you can yeah. access them without doing some very explicit things, then the language is broken. 
though. I mean, the the function uh, the function declaration in uh, Python clearly states that this one will be within the scope okay. of this function, and there is no um, sort of weird downward promotion where your your variables in higher scopes pollute your lower scope. Okay. So the you can, okay, what's the term, how you, you, you said like higher, lower, so it's not like a higher versus lower, it is just complete, something that's completely separate. <coughs> so when I use the term higher and lower, I'm talking about the next thing that we're moving into, not to overload the word thing too much, <laughs> um, which is about the locality. We've covered a little bit of this. Okay, now the only difference here is that there's two parameters. All right, and here you can see they declared a cap, adding these two parameters. All right, and here they passed in two strings, which happened to use the string concatenation and print it twice. All right, but what, what we were talking about has to do with the stack. And the stack is the, remember how I said that when a function gets called and it calls another function, all right, that it's returned back to the same line just after that function. So like if we have uh, A, finishes it returns back to a but in order to run this we do some sort of a up here okay at each level of entering a function there is something called a stack frame and the stack is the collection of all of the frames from all of the different nestings of function calls so as you enter a new function call, you push a new item onto the stack, a new stack frame. And this helps keep the variables separate inside the interpreter, okay? So like this cat here has this cat, which is defined up here, okay? So this cat twice declares a variable inside of it, cat, and assigns it to part one plus part two. So you'll notice that this cat, it exists inside the cat twice, but it doesn't actually exist anywhere else. When it is passed to print twice, okay, it's the, the value that's inside cat is referenced. But print inside twice use that variable called Bruce. So print twice oh, doesn't yeah. have a reference to the cat variable. It might have the value that used to be in the cat variable, but it doesn't have a reference to the cat variable. Does that help you? Okay. And so stack diagrams, the only thing that we really didn't cover on stack diagrams, and uh, I need to hand off to Evan. Thank you. All right, I wanted to give a quick shout out for a couple of things. Uh, Thank you for uh, leaving that first lecture, Ed. Uh, so we have uh, we have some questions. How do we want to communicate? We're looking at different solutions. Can I see a quick show of hands if you have used Google Hangouts and preferred over Slack? And then I'm going to see a quick show of hands for Slack. So those are the two that we're considering. But I'm not setting. I'm not. I'm not settling on Slack <laughs> because there are other Slack-like alternatives that are cheaper, like Discord. But I'm using the Slack option to see the people that like Slack is a thing. You know, because I'm not a slacker, so let's, let's find out how many, how many slackers we have there. I've seen you slack. I, yeah, I, 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 I just downloaded it. You were slacking uh, early. Slack this wants to be me. If you like slack, and then you say you're Uber Slack. Let's see. Show of hands for Slack. Oh, yeah, like Come on. Uh, I, I want to see a majority what's for one of these two things. I don't have to screw up with Slack or Google Hangouts? Or yeah. Slack like or Google Hangouts? If Slack like. Slack like. Slack like. Okay. So Google Hangouts like. 
Okay, we're in the shitter, so the slack guys win this one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If you so happen to put it on the middle of the hangout, it's all, yeah. all, all here if you hang out in the right way. <laughs> yes, yes! <laughs> Show me your ice cream tires. I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, another thing you should have until then. If you have not. Shown support by liking the page on Facebook, and you have a Facebook, please do so. If you don't have a Facebook, please do not sign up for us. Okay, that's like the social group that we have with you.